Welcome back, Bio 100 team. Happy to be with you today. Welcome in. And just know that your instructors see you working really, really hard, and we appreciate all you're doing. We're also very excited to bring you this content over the next couple of weeks, which is intended to take all the skill sets you've been learning so far in this uh, particular course and synthesize it with your life, your other classes, your goals, and help you identify resources to move forward in your career. What is this degree actually going to mean for you? We know you're investing a lot of your time and you're definitely investing a lot of your money in this degree path. We want it to mean something. We want you to feel empowered to know what to do when you go forward. And so we're going to kind of scratch the surface on a few tools that we think will help. So let's get the big picture here. What are the learning outcomes? Well, this particular video is intended to help you define personal and professional goals for beginning to identify opportunities of interest. You really kind of have to think about what's important to you. Know your values. We started the semester thinking about that with some of the quizzes and tutorials. And so that's kind of how we're going to finish it. We're going to have you guys create lists of skills based on your coursework and extracurricular activities such as volunteering and working so that you can, in the context of all of those things, your goals, your values, your skills, identify relevant jobs and opportunities to actually apply for. We're going to help you create a game plan, but first let's address the elephant in the room, that this is very hard. It's very scary actually. It can feel intimidating and it really forces you to be honest and embrace a little bit of the unknown. Defining goals is extremely challenging and will be refined over time. So this is a snapshot of where we, where we are now and we have to agree that this will evolve with each experience we have, whether that's a class or an internship or a volunteer experience. Your goal is to learn that as you go. And right now you're all here to get a degree. So you might think to yourself at the moment, okay, I, I want to do this when I graduate, and that's a great thing. It might change. And if it does change, that's quite okay. That's what you're here to do. You're here to figure that out and learn. And if you don't know what you're doing right now, know that you're not alone, and that's okay too, because we have a lot of time to go. So this requires us to really spend some time in self-reflection. Think about the journey and define it. Putting things down on paper really can help overcome fear just to get started, right? It's kind of like procrastinating for a class to study. There's a fear factor of just what's in that notebook, but when you start to pick it up and you start to spend some time with it, it feels better just to do it, especially when you plan ahead. And so that's kind of what we're going to do here when we think about the journey in your life. Easy to say, but there's kind of a couple of things you really need to think about when you're in the process of contemplating this path. And our life is in phases. Where we've been, or our past, it's important to know who you are, what makes you who you are, your family, your friends, your educational experiences, the work that you've done before you walked into this room, everything that got you here. It's important. It defines who you are and where you're going. Where are you now? Here you sit in the middle of or somewhere during the pursuit of a bachelor's degree, a bachelor's degree in science that's going to empower you to think and get careers that are going to change your life and change your family's life for the better. And what you do with that is in the future and can be whatever you want it to be. And it's okay if you don't know what that is right now. These tools that we're going to show you should help at least a little bit define those things as you define your goals and refine them. This is me, actually, believe it or not, on my undergraduate graduation day. And I'll animate this little speech bubble so that you know what I was thinking, which is that I was scared. I was really scared. And so I think the occasion called for a smile, and so I put one on my face.
but I had no idea what I was doing. Absolutely none. I didn't know what was ahead. I hadn't really thought about it. I was the first one in my family to go to college, and so there wasn't a lot of support along the way to understand what a degree was going to mean. In fact, I actually had two degrees in French literature and in biology. And I know what you're thinking. That's weird.、Uh, I know it is. What a strange combination. And so I had no idea what to do with those two things. And I really had done no planning along the way. I just was trying to get through, just trying to make it to the end. And you might feel that way. And so we really want to help put the brakes on just for a little bit here. So, that we can help you make a plan. It's a really important part of this process, and it's okay if the plan changes, but we just want to help you start. Believe it or not, I took that really, really popular I know everybody wants to do this combination of degrees, right? French and biology, oh, yes, everybody's clamoring. It's very, very hot. I took that, and the first thing I did when I graduated is I went to Japan. And I lived there, and among the other things I did was teach English. It fundamentally changed my life, and I had absolutely no idea that was going to happen to me. If I was taking Bio 100 and I was en route to my degree, and someone told me that was going to happen ahead, I would have laughed. I would have thought they were joking. But it did happen. And if someone looked at me in Bio 100 and said, Someday you're going to be a professor. I, I would have looked behind me and thought they were confused and talking to somebody else. Please remember that as you plan, it's okay to feel uncomfortable and it's okay to feel scared. We're all there, we've been there, and we do understand. And always, always remember it's okay to change your course. So now that you've spent some time thinking about yourself, thinking about your priorities, Thinking about the people you want to empower with your education, with the career you want to have. Thinking about what you want all this to mean. And if that's to make a lot of money, that's fine. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. If that's a primary goal and a primary function of why you're here, well, I agree. Please don't let anybody tell you that's a problem. If it's to help you better take care of your own kids or your parents or your grandparents, that's fantastic too. I hope you've been able to really think about those things and what's really important to you. Now that we've done so, let's put some pen to paper. Okay? Let's create some objectives. We always provide you some learning outcomes and objectives for the things we're doing in class. Why wouldn't we apply the same logic to our own lives? I do this all the time. I sit down every month and make goals for myself, both personal and professional goals. What do I want to achieve in my courses I'm teaching? What do I want to achieve with my health, both my physical health and my mental health? Am I running? Am I seeing my counselor? Am I getting everything right that I need to? Usually the answer is no, but <laughs> I can at least point to some things that are positive. And when you write things down, it forces you to think about them. And it forces you to evaluate how you're doing and make a plan to get there. I may have realized my goals were too ambitious for、um, doing this thing or that thing, and so I have to refine them. And so it's very, very important to think about this. When you write your objectives for yourself, is to create reasonable timelines with reasonable goals. Reasonable timelines with reasonable goals. And it's hard to know what that is until you start, and then you'll get to feel. For yourself, what that is. Maybe、um, your pace to get somewhere is going to be different than someone else's, and, and that's fine too. And so, understanding what is reasonable is part of the process. So, really, really think critically. Be honest. Think about your strengths, think about your weaknesses in those two categories, professionally and personally. And when you're thinking about weaknesses, Don't think about them negatively in the sense of, oh boy, I'm going to beat myself up about this. You can think about them instead as, here's areas I don't yet feel good about and I want to improve and I will improve upon. You don't have your degree yet, so there might, that might be coursework related,、um, that might be something related to how you interact with other folks. It could be anything.、Um, And those can help you define your goals for what you want to do to attack those weaknesses. okay? And use your strengths that you already have to get there. 
it's really, really important to think about plans A and B for getting from A to B. You're right now at point A, and you want to get somewhere, and that'll be point B. As you can tell by the last little story I gave you briefly, my path was a curvy, wervy, twisty A to B. Not a straight line. Not a straight line at all. In fact, most people's paths are not a straight line from A to B, and that's quite fine. I'd argue that the curvy, wervy paths are the more interesting ones, and I would never trade what I did. So we have to think about how to get from A to B. We need a plan A, and we need a plan B. And plan B does not necessarily mean it's not going to be the thing you think you're doing. It just could be a transitionary step to get there. For example, potentially your goal is to be an optometrist, and you love eye juice, and you just got to get into that eye juice, right? But maybe uh, you apply this first year after graduating and you don't get in. But that's still plan A. Okay, You need a plan B to maybe bridge you there. Maybe it's going to be working in a clinic a little bit more. Maybe it's going to be doing some research at the lab bench in this sector. Planning ahead is important. Having a plan B is also empowering you because potentially you're out there doing that thing and you realize, hmm, I actually like this better. Maybe I don't want to go study eye juice and I'd rather go do some more research and maybe I want to go do a biotech job. Right Now you have some skills to put on your resume, and I always say that, that skills to pay the bills, okay? Make progress, build momentum. It doesn't have to be so black and white. In other words, a research experience in microbiology could be just as helpful as one in an optometry setting for getting you there. Any experience using your degree is going to be good experience. And learning what you like and don't like is super important. So just as it is to define your strengths and weaknesses, learning what you like and don't like is part of the process. If you're sitting here not knowing what you like yet, that's okay. That's part of why you're here. In fact, I'd argue that's the whole reason you're here. You're probably not going to remember every mechanism every professor puts down on a piece of paper and asks you to remember in a course. I wouldn't and you have Google for that later on. But the going through the process of the self-discovery to understand who you are and what you want is arguably the most important function of what you're here to do, along with defining your critical thinking skills. This is normal. We all have to do it. And you'll probably always have to do this well beyond when you leave here. Defining a plan A and B and thinking about the steps to get there is just as important for a student who's sitting here with a 4.0 as it is for a student sitting here with a 1.0. Nobody gets around this. It's just as relevant to everybody. So please don't feel like this is a problem or a sign of you not um, understanding what you're doing. It's being practical and we all need to do it. Throughout this video series related to this uh, job function and searching, um, we're going to use the tools available to you to help you identify how to make a plan B to get to your plan A. Okay, so that's to come. It's really critical, as I said, to establish reasonable goals. And goals require timelines. We, we kind of have to set deadlines for ourselves. Otherwise, it's easy to forget. It's easy to procrastinate. It's easy to think, well, that's not important. It's easy to forget them. So keeping yourself honest requires a timeline. So what might that look like? Well, here our goal is to um, help you create a game plan for the job market. And so we first have to perform some research. And this is going to take time. Um, luckily, we have lots of great online tutorials um, and helpful resources available to everybody on the internet. And so we're going to perform some research online um, to help identify areas of interest to you. You might not know what they are yet. That might come with the research. We want to establish a timeline for generating questions and seeking answers. You're going to do a lot of searching and left, be left with more questions than answers sometimes. You find a job. You see the required skill set and functions. Some of them you don't even understand. You might think the job is super interesting and not know how to get to that job. 
Do I need to take a different class? Do I need to do a volunteer experience? What would that be? So you perform research and you need to generate questions and find time to get answers to those questions. Can you think already in your mind that, wow, this timeline is going to be long? It could. And so we don't ever want to wait until the last minute to do something as important as plan a job search or, or look ahead for an internship, things like that. It's never, never, never too early to start. You need to define the skill set. Um, as you look at opportunities, they'll very clearly tell you what you need. And so you have to think about where you are now, what your existing skill set looks like, and where you need to be, what the desired skill set is, so that you're a match. We need to plan time into this whole process for creating application materials and then going through the challenging process of refining them. This does take a lot of time. Um, we'll absolutely provide you with more uh, details on this particular bullet in the subsequent videos related to the last couple of weeks here. We know this part's really challenging and that biology is a very, very different beast than other fields when it comes down to creating, uh, say, a resume or um, a cover letter, and uh, maybe you're thinking about a LinkedIn profile, and we're going to talk about all these things. And it does take quite a bit of back and forth and drafting um, and understanding how to get the right things in there and, and knowing where to look. For example, your, your old lab manuals, that, that they're a great place to look for the skill sets you actually acquired. And so we'll talk about all these going forward. Then you have to submit the applications, and, and that takes time too. Even though the world is very conveniently uh, enabling you to apply for jobs with a click of a button, it still takes time to go and, and enter your personal information sometimes into a database and then upload your resume. And we recommend here you thinking about having a template for your job materials that maybe have to uh, have sl slight tweaks for each job you apply to, um, to focus on one skill set or another, right, uh, beyond your sort of base skill set. And so um, we'll get into all of these things and help you know when to sell this and, and reorder that. We'll, we'll help with all that. Again, it takes a lot of time. Time then to do all of this requires what I say are the three P's, persistence, positivity, and patience. Not easy things. The job search can be soul sucking and it could take a lot of time for you to get that right opportunity. Just remember, you do have power in the process. You don't have to take the first thing that comes along if you get a bad feeling about the opportunity when you visit, say, during an interview. And we'll talk about that too. So being persistent, positive, and patient will pay off in the long run. The run is long. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And if you're tired of my little analogies, I understand. Um, but this is an important thing that I've boxed down there. Um, We often apply to things and don't even hear back from the companies. I've read research that shows that up to half of all jobs that you see online aren't even live jobs. They've been filled internally. They're just up there. Think about that for a moment. That's mind-blowing. I didn't, I didn't know any of those things when I was first searching. Even after I had a very specialized degree later on in my life, I got my PhD, and I started to apply for biotech jobs, I applied for up to 100 jobs and only heard from about two of them for um, what were interviews. And I thought my skill sets were perfectly matched. I thought I had a great education. I was shocked that I was hitting at such a low rate. That can really shake your confidence. That can really make you feel bad. We're all going to be in that boat. Nobody is going to be above this boat. And so that's why thinking about your goals Being honest with the timeline, that it's going to take time, will help you stay positive and not make you doubt yourself. Or hopefully just minimize the doubt you might be feeling, as it's pretty natural to do so. 
Okay, with all that said, let's help you actually make some progress on both the personal and professional items, and we're going to start with professional growth. First, how do we identify industries of interest? You might have no idea about any industry and therefore not know what's interesting to you. There's lots of ways to do this. We're going to get to a few. You could visit the Campus Career Center. We have one in Lassen Hall. You can attend workshops to learn more. As you're walking around campus buildings, pay close attention to flyers. Faculty sometimes will organize little workshops for you. For example, applying to graduate school, learning where you can get money to get paid to go to graduate school. That might blow your mind right there to know that a master's and a PhD are often and can be fully funded and pay you on top of the fee waivers for tuition, a little stipend to live on. We can teach you how to do that. Look for the workshops, look for the flyers. Speaking of faculty, we have offices, we have office hours. We're always delighted to talk to you. Engage with your faculty, talk to them. I know that's very hard. It can be very intimidating to go into a faculty's office and start to engage with them and ask questions. It requires bravery and courage. We know, we understand, but our door will be open and we're ready to talk about our career paths and provide you advice towards yours whenever you're ready. Don't forget that all these career paths and graduate programs you're thinking about are at some point going to require some references and some letters of recommendation. And those are often going to be, um, at least one of them, um, from a faculty member. And so taking time to get to know the faculty and letting the faculty know you really helps that process along. I like to tell students that some of the best letters I like to write are for students who actually got a C in my class, but who, who actually I knew very, very well and could explain why that C happened. It's actually easier for me to do that than a student who got an A in a class, but I didn't really talk to at all. You want to actually facilitate that for your professional growth. Talk to your peers, both current and former students. What a great resource. Ask your friends, what did you do to get from point A to point B? What was your plan B? How did you find this information? Ask good questions. And then, of course, ah, uh, the three dubs, www, the World Wide Web of Things. You can perform online research on your own. Look at forums. Look at group chats. Scientists love actually to do this, talk online about things. Not just uh, how to get an experiment done, but how to get from point A to point B. YouTube's a great resource. You can look at videos, and um, I'm going to give you some examples here. Here's an example. You might be thinking to yourself right now, I want to be a pharmacist. I'm going to join the Future Pharmacists Student Organization, FPSO. Little plug there. We have lots of student organizations on campus for all of the different things you might be thinking about doing to learn more. They're a great club for the record. I mean, they bring guest speakers onto campus from pharmacies, from grad programs, for example. Um, they have opportunities for you to go out into those sectors and, and get some hands-on experience. Student organizations, what a great resource. YouTube as well. This is a little thing from YouTube. I just put in there into the search bar, what is it like to be a pharmacist? You can put, what is it like to be an optometrist? You could put, what is it like to be a doctor? You could put, what is it like to be a botanist? You could put, what is it like to be an evolutionary biologist? You can put anything in there and you're going to get some hits and some videos from professionals and from students on what it's really, really like. So you'll see all these hits here. Very importantly, take time to not just watch one video, but to watch several videos and vet those contents for yourself. Some of them might be very, very helpful. Some of them might not be. 
if someone is overly and only complimentary or overly and only complaining, chances are you're going to get a very slanted, therefore, view. And so try to find some balance. Don't just read the reviews that are all one way or the other, but are very realistic and explain the challenges, what's hard, how to overcome those challenges, but also what's great and what's redeeming and ultimately why they get so much satisfaction about that thing. Great videos actually take you inside the lab or inside the clinic and give you a, a bit of a hands-on view in addition to providing you some idea of just the functionality itself. You want to look for areas of inspiration. Do you want to be, for example, that person in the top left with the cap and gown and face mask doing very, very important research? That's exciting to me, but maybe not to you, and that's fine. Remember, this is not a one-size-fits-all model. Everybody's different, and that's the whole point. So, YouTube. What is it like to be a whatever you want to fill in there? Okay, I always think that part of the internet's challenge is knowing what to put in the search bar. So hopefully that's a little helpful. A second thing you could do for professional growth that I hinted at a little bit ago, but now it's time to really be practical and put on paper about, is to list skill sets that you hope to learn, so some new skills, and to list some skill sets that you want to build upon, that you might be familiar with. So this requires honesty, and just know that it's okay that you might only be familiar with a particular, let's say, experimental procedure, like PCR. By the time you graduate, you might only still be familiar with it. That's okay, you don't have to be an expert. In fact, when you apply to the right level of job, the job market knows what you are. You're a bachelor's degree holder. You're a student who just graduated. And you're going to have to be familiar, but not an expert in things. That's why you go out and get a job and get experience, is to further refine that skill set and expertise in a very, very focused manner. The bachelor's degree is ultimately very general. You have to take lots of GEs and things like physics and um, even though you might uh, not understand why sometimes, and I totally get that. I never knew why I had to take physics. Physics, for example, was extremely intimidating and I did not do well. Not at all. Pretty much told me engineering was not a possibility. That was such a good experience. It is so good to learn what you don't like and what you're not good at as you refine. So, be honest and be real. Where might you find skill sets? Well, old syllabi. Sometimes professors have written little bullet points for objectives that go beyond simply just big picture learning items, but also at the nitty gritty, especially if it's a lab class, of what tangible hands-on skill sets you might walk out of that class with. And on that note, you can look at your lab manuals. All of you take a lot of lab classes in the biology major, both in biology and in chemistry and in physics. And so there's lots of tools there that you can sell as being very familiar with, especially as you look at jobs that require you to have some familiarity, at least, with those techniques. Then define roles. These are sort of intangible skill sets that might have come from your volunteering and work experiences. For example, leadership, time management. These are quantifiables, and that's important that you do quantify it. Don't just say, I lead, I'm a leader. Um, you say, I led a team of X people to do this thing. You can have concrete examples from your actual experiences, and that's important. Some of you might think, well, that's only from, let's say, working uh, as a manager at a restaurant. That's okay. That counts. Actually, it's very important that you do list that on your resume, on your personal statements, and your cover letters. The fact that you did that on top of your jobs is a really important function. In fact, a program like Clinical Lab Science, 
when you apply, they have a points-based system to get into these training programs after the bachelor's degree. And you get points for having a job, a normal job, a job that paid your way through school. And if you didn't put that on there, you wouldn't get those points. So just know that the world values all the things you're doing in some way. And as you go on, maybe that experience at McDonald's that you had drops off a little bit, and that's fine too. It has for me. But boy, I sure put that I worked at McDonald's at a really young age and that I worked two jobs a lot of the time to pay my way through school. That's an important thing. So now that you have not just said that you're a hard worker, but showed them you're a hard worker, you next want to contextualize the function of the job you are seeking. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? The function of the job you are seeking. Well, here's my little analogy from what I think is a fantastic movie. Yes, the Lego movie, and yeah, that's Emmett down there. He was a builder, or he thought he was a builder, but he didn't really know what he was, actually. He kind of underestimated himself the whole time, didn't he? Who are you, and what are your skill sets? You might not even know what they are, but just know that certain jobs have certain functions. Some are very practical, require a lot of hands-on doing. And maybe you love that idea. Maybe that's you. You want to get your hands in there. You want to pick up a pipette. And you want to aliquot till the sun goes down. Fantastic. That's your function. Maybe you want to be more hands-on with people. You want to provide tangible inspiration that you can see. Each job has a function. A researcher is certainly, ultimately, potentially helping people. But that's not so immediate. You don't see that so often when you're at the lab bench. If you're in a clinic, and let's say you're serving as a scribe for a physician, you can see how immediately you're helping a family of people in a hospital bed. So what is the function? What are you inclined to do? Do you want to be a builder? Do you want to be a thinker? Do you want to be both? Is it abstract? Speaking of abstract, let's talk about personal growth, which is just as important, if not more. We talked about it. We need to write it down. We need to define your values. It'll be interesting to see if you keep a long-term log of these over time, what stays the same and what changes as you do. So, and I know this might sound very odd and different, but think about the environment that you might work in and how you appreciate being trained and supported. This is a two-way street, and as I said before, you don't have to take the first thing that comes along. Your person needs to develop. An environment may or may not suit that depending on how you learn. Just like how you study. Some people are auditory learners, some people are not. Some people are visual learners, some people are not. Some people need a combination of approaches. Some people like YouTube videos, some people do not. What are you? How do you train? How do you like to be supported? What kind of tools do you value? What kind of benefits do you value? What kind of support do you need? Companies, graduate programs, and anything beyond this just like a campus that you're on now, is variable for these things. And some are great matches and some aren't. So think about the support you need to do the job. Don't just think that every company is the same and that it's a problem of yours if you don't figure this out or whatever. No, no, no. Actually, sometimes it's the environment and, and maybe it's not the right one for you. And it has nothing to do with your skills. Be empowered to do that. Be empowered to take control of your career 
your education, and think about what you need and how to get it. We'll talk about both of those things. One way is by looking at companies um, on their online websites and tools and things like that uh, that provide mission statements and vision statements that match the values that you have. That might sound weird and and I understand, but companies are trying to give you an idea of why they exist and what their goals are. And you might need to do this a little bit. Research, look at their goals, help you define your own goals, and then see where the match exists. And in fact, when you do get to writing a cover letter, one of the first components or the last components of the cover letter, and definitely a component of the interview, is seeing for you and for the employer how the mission aligns. Are you inspired and excited by the thing they're doing that requires a shared vision? Be empowered to not just think, I need skills to pay the bills, which is important, but also, I want to use those skills to pay the bills in a context where from nine to five or more for more than 40 hours a week, maybe, I have to feel inspired and motivated to keep coming in. And of course, that is not a, an absolute thing that uh, we, we feel every single day. We wax and wane. But ultimately, you're going to feel more empowered and you're going to care more about what you're doing if where you're at trains you in a way that matches what you need and is an overall mission towards something that you feel inspired by. Importantly, you need to establish salary expectations and identify a place to live. And we're going to do this uh, in the next couple of videos, really give you some tools and tricks to think about. Um, but it's important to right in the beginning, as you're making this big plan, this overall plan, establish salary expectations and a place of living that provide you with comfort to live the life that you want, to have the family you want, to do the things you want in your life. This is your life. All you are here to get this degree to empower your life. Salary and where you're living, the geography, well, doesn't get more important. Oh, look at this. Just like we had in the professional arena, we want you to list perceived strengths and weaknesses. We have to be honest with the things we do well and not. How do you work in group settings? How do you feel about having to collaborate? Does the job you're seeking require it? One thing I hear a lot of from students early on is, I chose a biology major because I don't like to talk to other people and so I'm gonna just do a research position. Or I don't like math, so I'll do that research position. Sadly, research bench science requires you to do both of those things, communicate and do math. And so please do some research along with us so you know what the world is looking for and know what your strengths and weaknesses are so you can build on them on the personal level interpersonal skills when I write letters of recommendation for pharmacy schools and for clinical lab programs and other things like that there's also a list of things they want us to talk about beyond the classroom regarding your interpersonal skills resilience time management all those things how do you fit? You really want to write them down. What are some examples that illustrate the things you've done in management and communication, things like this, or things you haven't? Identify perceived strengths and weaknesses. The last piece we're going to touch on, and again, none of this is comprehensive. There's lots more things we could talk about, but we're getting a start. This piece is define your comfort zone and be realistic with your fears. My big piece of advice to y'all is to avoid fear-based decision making. I'd like to think that I'm going to have a nice long life and I'd like to think that at the end of it I'll look back and have no regrets on the things that I chose to do. That I'll have no regrets about all the times I tried something and failed. I can live with that. 
What I could never live with is looking back one day and wondering why I didn't try. I can absolutely, and as a scientist, this is almost a prerequisite, be okay with failure. Most experiments fail. We don't have cures for cancer yet. Brilliant people are trying to find the cure. We have to be okay with failure. We can't be afraid to take a risk. But you first have to think about how far you're willing to go, what your comfort zone is, and be realistic with what your fears are. Write them down. This might be new, and that's okay. In sum, know your values, know your worth, and know that you can do it. And putting a plan into place is one of the most important first steps, requiring honesty, but also hard work ahead. Know your values. Know your worth. It could exceed your wildest expectations.